Welcome everyone to our Sentinel Hub webinar. Today we will discuss the use of satellite data in journalism and the topic will be presented by our special guest Christoph Kuttel, a visual investigations journalist with the New York Times video team specializing in the analysis of satellite imagery, video and other visual evidence. So Christoph is an expert on armed conflicts, human rights and social media verification. And he was part of a team who won the 2022 Pulitzer Prize for international reporting for coverage of the civilian toll of US air and drone strikes. We will conclude uh, his presentation with Q&A session, which will be joined by uh, our team members, Pierre Marcus and Andra Zlinski. I'm Sabina Dulinz and I'm part of the Sentinel Hub team and I'll try to take care that our webinar runs as smooth as possible. That would be all from my side. Enjoy today's presentation and Christoph, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Sabina, also for perfectly pronouncing my last name. That's a very rare treat. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm very excited to be here today. Um, and as you heard in the intro, I'm, <clears throat> I'm working at the New York Times and I'm part here specifically of the visual investigations team. Um, that team really uses visual evidence at the core of our reporting. So we do not just produce articles and then add pictures later to it, but uh, we really build our stories around photos and videos and in my case, very often uh, satellite images. As an intro, um, I, I put this together, this little talk together as really with, with journalists who are not experts in satellite imagery as the target audience. But I'm hoping there are also maybe others who have more expertise in remote sensing or scientists on the call, because as you will hear, um, I very often have to rely on experts like a regular journalist um, in terms of like image interpretation or image processing. So I'm always looking for additional sources and contacts and collaborations. So I hope that there's something in there for everyone. Um, and I want to really focus on my daily workflow in using uh, satellite imagery, because I hope that's the most useful thing for, for journalists um, and also what tools I use very often. Uh, this will not be a comprehensive talk. I'm really focusing on more uh, focused research in terms of looking at very specific incidents and events and locations and features. So I use a lot of very high resolution imagery, but uh, over the last few years I've learned really the value and the added value of the medium to lower resolution imagery, uh, such as Sentinel imagery. Um, so I'm going to walk you, you through that a little bit, but I also want to end with throwing out various examples around artificial intelligence and, and, and radar imagery and scripts and that kind of stuff that I think becomes increasingly important and that I hope will be helpful for the Q&A afterwards. Um, at the end, I'm also going to have a slide with resources um, and links. So if you're interested in this topic, you can look that up later once the video is published, um, which I hope will be useful as well. To kick it off before I go into sort of my little mini case study, I want to just highlight a few um, principles that I use that I try to force myself to use and because often I forget them as well and I will bring some examples where I spectacularly failed in my work um, to like really help me to achieve my reporting goals. Um, some of these might sound very obvious but I want to quickly throw them out there because I come back to them during the talk. Uh, the, <clears throat> the first thing is, is really try to think about what you are actually looking for in satellite imagery and what sort of providers might have the image and what sort of resolution you might need. Um, what that means is before I even start looking at imagery, I sometimes try to take a few minutes to write down what I'm looking for or even draw things out what I'm looking for. And what I mean with that is, for example, if I hear about an airstrike close to a mosque or to a school or to a prison and I have to actually find the location first, you know, how, how do you find a mosque in a satellite image? It's a very good example because a mosque, if you build it, it's normally oriented differently or in, in many cases it's oriented differently than other buildings because it's oriented towards Mecca. So if you have a very organized city in the grid system, a, a mosque might stand out very easily in addition to maybe the minaret and the dome that you might see in a, in a satellite image. In a refugee camp, there might be a tent being set up as a mosque that might not have the minaret and the dome, and every tent looks the same, but that specific tent might look, number one, big or is larger, 
but it also again in a in an organized refugee camp with a grid system it might be oriented differently so it might be easier to spot in a satellite image so it's that kind of stuff that as, as some small examples to kick it off to really think about before you get started <clears throat> Use multiple images, satellite images. Um, try to establish a time series. Don't just rely on one satellite images. If you rely on one single satellite image, the, the risk for error and misinterpretation becomes really, really high. So that's just a very basic principle. Similarly, use multiple satellite image providers. I do not just use one satellite image provider. My, the usual suspects that I'm using, Planet, Maxer, sometimes Airbus, and a lot of European Space Agency and even NASA, NASA, so that's very helpful to sort of compare different satellite images and establish very clear time timelines. And I use very different sources, geospatial sources such as geonames or similar, but I also rely a lot on videos and photos and keep combining all of this together in addition to interviews, right? What journalists do, of course. Um, that's how we get the strongest uh, output and the strongest stories. And the last thing I want to mention here is similar to any other source that you might be interviewing, be very critical of satellite imagery analysis, right? The image itself might never lie, but the human interpretation of that image could lead to errors, as we all know. And um, it's, it can be a very, very hard sort of work to, to do image interpretation. So really be critical of image analysis itself. And again, use multiple images, multiple providers. That's a way to sort of avoid mistakes in addition to trying to maybe use competing hypotheses and using structured analytic techniques to be to sort of approach your research and your reporting. Um, and I want to get on a, a little bit more hands on now and to sort of like as an introduction, I want to highlight and work you through my workflow of a very small and simple example, which I hope will be useful. Um, and this is from March of 2019. There were reports of an attack against a village in central Mali um, that led to the burning down of that village and a lot of victims. Um, so I, I, I received these reports and that happens on a lot of, uh, like almost every week. Um, <clears throat> and we're hearing that, oh, this is actually a pretty remote area. It's difficult to get there, but it's also at that point very dangerous to go there because there is a little bit of conflict going on and the armed groups operating in that area. So we can rely on some witnesses and residents that have fled the area, but can you check satellite imagery to see what's going on, right? So this is sort of like the simplest request that I get on a very regular basis. Um, here's sort of a screenshot of an associated press story published by Voice of America. And they also, Voice of America also published a simple map that put sort of like a, a, a locator where that specific village is. It's called Ogasogu in central Mali. And they put a little insert in there, which is a high resolution image from before the attack, which I think they just pulled from uh, Google Earth. So this was my starting point for sort of like looking and verifying the information that we're getting from eyewitnesses and from news reports. <clears throat> so here I am now in Sentinel on the, and on the Sentinel Hub, which is uh, to some degree the focus of today's talk as well and how I use it. I hope most of you have already you know, used this tool. You can set up an account, which is free, and it actually allows you to, to uh, add some additional features, which is quite nice. So um, this is a Sentinel-2 image from March 24th, 2019, and it's two days after the reported attacks. I just put in the coordinates up here in the little search box, very standard, and this is the same village that was published by Voice of America. The, the spatial resolution, of course, is a little bit lower here in Sentinel-2 imagery. Um, and what I'm looking for, and it comes back to now, like what am I actually interested in and what am I expecting? So there were reports that the village was burned down and that should look very clear marks on the surface of the earth. So, so we should see scorched earth, we should see destroyed vegetation, and we should see damaged or burnt down structures. In this case, it's probably mostly traditional round tukuls. So you might see sort of like the walls of this little tukul st uh, standing still, but the, the roof might be missing, which is very consistent with <coughs> fire damage. Um, in my experience, what is super useful <clears throat> when you look at these kind of things 
um, and I have worked a lot of the four when I started out this work 15 years ago, back then more as a project manager. It, this kind of this kind of damage really stands out in satellite imagery and what is helpful if you actually look at it in fall in so-called false color imagery. So you you're using an invisible band of the electromagnetic spe spectrum that's collected by the satellite images and you visualize it. Um, if you use a false color infrared satellite image, the vegetation, healthy vegetation will look very, very red. So what you see here is trees that the little red dots here are trees or bushes um, <clears throat> and they all pop out very, very clearly. Um, in red and so this sort of technique or this kind of imagery is used a lot to monitor the health of vegetation and has uses and applications in agriculture and crop monitoring and similar things. In my case, I use it a lot for conflict monitoring and impact of conflict on, on let's say, vegetation or human settlements. Um, the first thing I'm noticing is actually that the village that, you know, with the name Oga Sogo, that has been published actually looks quite intact in the sense that um, it does not look like there's a lot of fire damage. And as I said at the beginning, maybe do not rely on one satellite image alone, but maybe go back in time to see how this looks. You can, with the Sentinel Hub, right, you can just jump back a couple of days and try to find a cloud free image. So this is five days before and it looks pretty much identical. I'm going to go back to uh, the 24th image. So I was a little bit suspicious if maybe this is the right location, which sometimes can happen with the small villages. And if you only rely on Google and Google Maps and you type in the name of the village, this is the village you would get. So what I did is I started actually looking around the area to look for what I would expect um, fire damage looks like. In real, in real life, this took me probably an hour, a little bit longer. So I'm going very quickly here because I know already where I'm going. But when I moved over here, I suddenly noticed not one, but actually two villages that seem to show some of the scorched earth marks that I'm looking for, including the damaged vegetation. <clears throat> so this is something that I was expecting to see. Here you have an intact village or what I believe is an intact settlement. And then here's the area that has been burnt down. Um, if you log into Sentinel Hub, if you like check this, you can actually do a nice slider and before after image, right? So I'm adding this specific image from March 24th to compare. Then I'm going back to my March 19th image. And go, the, go to the compare function. And it becomes very clear that like, yes, something happened is this in this five day window. And again, the, the false color imagery is actually quite helpful here because it really highlights uh, the fire damage. And you could go back further now in time, uh, uh, back further in time to sort of like, you know, check a little bit more. <clears throat> what is very nice um, with Sentinel Hub is that you can now download this image, right? So if you log in and you go here to the download function, you can just download this basic image for publication, but you can also download it as a geo-referenced file. In this case, I want to download the false color image. So that highlights the healthy and the damaged vegetation, but I don't want to have it as a JPEG, but as a Google Earth file. So it's either KMC, in this case it's KMC or it could be also KML. So this is what I'm downloading now. Um, because what that allows me to do, once I switch to Google Earth, this is the village with the name Ogasogo. And now I'm just, I downloaded the image already. So to save some time, this is now the image that I downloaded from Sentinel Hub and I just dragged and dropped it into Google Earth. And as you can see, it's nicely referenced. It lines up perfectly with the road here. If you've ever tried to align a JPEG um, over Google Earth, it's quite an undertaking. So if this is G-referenced, uh, it's obviously super, super useful. So the first thing I can do is because this is more the, the lower resolution from Sentinel, if you if I turn off the overlay, then you actually see the settlement very, very clearly. Here are the trees that I'm talking about that have been damaged. Here are all the round structures that the tukuls that I was talking about. I'm turning on my Sentinel-2 false color image again. If you turn on now Google, uh, just the labels, the name of the towns, 
The problem is these towns are not named, right? So there's no name for this village. If you have, if you use uh, just Google, you have the town of Oversogo, right? That's why the misidentification. So don't forget that it's not just Google that you can use, but a lot of other sources that I mentioned, Geonomes, Wikimap here, OpenStreetMap and similar. And what most or some people don't know is that you can actually pull that data also into Google Earth. So again, I'm coming back to use different data sources and combine them. If I turn on the Geonames data folder in my Google Earth, suddenly village names start popping up. And what I'm noticing is that this village actually has an almost identical name. And so this is the village that the witnesses were talking about. Nicely enough, it, Geonames also has data for the, for the other village that I, that I noticed up here once it loads, uh, has this specific name and I actually found um, a third village up here that was also burned down. So what I was able to use to use this workflow is I was able to identify the correct location that the witnesses are talking about. I was able to narrow down the time frame to five days, right? So that is consistent what the witnesses tell me and what the reports are saying. Additionally, I was able to identify two more villages, so it was not an attack against one town, but actually three little towns. So all of this now makes me very, very confident in what actually happened, in finding very hard evidence in what happened. And this would allow me now to build a strong stories, combining strong visuals, but also the witnesses, right? We had a couple of photographs from the ground as well that people had on their cell phones. So now I suddenly have a lot of materials to work with. And what I would also do normally in terms of um, further confirming the date, the actual day, maybe also the time. Number one, I could use other providers, maybe PlanetScope to see if they have an image that narrows down the time window. But what I always do in these kind of cases, I'm also using NASA active fire data, right? So NASA is collecting data. Mostly the, the, the intended use is to, to monitor wildfires. Um, so they have their satellites, I think, over every place on Earth twice a day to look for heat anomalies. Um, a lot of people use the, the, the browser based version of that, but there's a really great website that I'm going to show, which is called Firms, where you can actually download the data and you can pull it again into Google Earth and overlay it. In this case, I downloaded the fire data. I found some fires over here. It looks like this. It's not an image, but it gives you the coordinates with the exact time and the actually a timestamp somewhere up down to the minute, right? Uh, when there was an active fire detected. In this case, this was not successful. And the reason was either the fire was not large enough or maybe the fire only like was for a couple of hours when the satellites were not uh, over the specific area. Uh, but I want to show you how this looks like on a, in a current example in a real life uh, scenario. This is now Ukraine in the Bakhmut area, which is an area that's heavily, you know, there was heavily heavy fighting over the last few weeks and months. And this is active fire data from May. And what you see is the exact opposite what you would expect from NASA fire data, because normally you would see the fires either in forests or in fields when it's used for agricultural burning. Here you barely have any fires in the fields, but all the active fire detections are concentrated in the city. So it can be used for conflict monitoring it as well. I'm normally very careful with this kind of data because there is a lot of room for, for errors. The spatial resolution of the sensors is pretty wide. So what you get here with the coordinates are probably center points. So if this is a one kilometer, a one kilometer spatial resolution, you know, the coordinates might be a little bit off. Um, there might be, you know, you have to consider seasonal burnings or agricultural burnings. So I would never use that source alone, but combining it maybe with witness testimony, with optical satellite imagery, with videos and photos, it really allows you to sort of like narrow down your timeline and get much more details. Um, maybe let me see one more sort of like current example, how I use the overlaying of satellite imagery and satellite uh, imagery. So it's this thing here, like this week for a very different context. <clears throat> and then I'm not going to show that, but I'm just going to share the story while I'm switching between the Google Earth and the browser again. We, we are asked a lot to verify video content and photos and so on. So a big step of that is geolocating videos that we receive, um, meaning finding the exact coordinates of where a specific video was filmed. <clears throat> 
So you might have heard about the incursion into Russia this week of that uh, armed group that is, you know, seems to be associated with Ukraine or Russia. Um, so we had a video of them lining up in a small convoy of interesting military vehicles near a border crossing into Russia, and they were filming that, and they panned nicely around. And what you saw in the background was a beautiful yellow field, which immediately reminded me of where I was growing up, because these are canola fields that are currently blooming, and it's a pretty big field, and it's very, very bright and yellow. So I immediately saw like this should show up very easy in satellite imagery. So I went to planet scope imagery and to Sentinel to the Sentinel hub and I downloaded the Sentinel 2 image because sure enough, the canola fields showed up very nicely, more greenish than yellow. So I overlaid it. I know the road roughly where they were going towards the border post and there were around five fields along that road. Um, so I just looked at one field after the other. I turned off the image again and looked at the high resolution image in Google Earth to match the features in the video um, with the, the high resolution satellite imagery on Google Earth. And it only took me 15 minutes to confirm the exact location of that video. And again, the canola fields were just such a good giveaway that it was really, really fast and you don't need the high resolution stuff for that. It also narrows down a little bit the time frame in the sense that, oh, it told me that the video was probably filmed in the last few weeks because the canola was not blooming before. That's not really good enough to sort of like say this happened really on that specific date, but then you can obviously use other techniques for that. So this is just another example of how to use Sentinel imagery in the day to day sort of like reporting and verification work that um, I think a lot of journalists are more and more asked to do these days and obviously these kind of data sources around videos and photos and social media uh, content become more and more important in for every journalist. So these are kind of like nice little tricks to do that kind of work. <clears throat> just very quickly, I just want to show this. Um, this is the active fire data that I was referencing. And again, this is not browser based, which is still very useful if you use that. But here you can just download the data as a shapefile or as a Google Earth file and uh, drag and drop it over into your Google Earth and you're ready to go. Uh, coming back to Mali, the last thing that I would do is um, then look for actually high resolution, very high resolution satellite image imagery. Because for public consumption, you know, the public of course is used to satellite imagery that they see on Google Maps. So I try to always get very high resolution imagery for that reason in terms of presentation, but also having the high resolution satellite image then would allow me to maybe do it a proper damage assessment and count as well. So what you can do a tool that I really, really like to find high resolution imagery, at least the availability, it doesn't show you the actual high resolution imagery. There's a website called Image Hunter by Apollo Mapping that is super useful. It's a reseller but the, having basically um, the data from all different kinds of satellite image providers from around the world. So all I did is put in the coordinates of the village that was attacked here. I drew a little bounding box around it. Here are your filters and narrowed it down to March of 2019. I changed the spatial resolution to one meter or below, and then I searched and I got two hits. P1 stands for Pleiades, so that's Airbus. Um, and that is 50 centimeter resolution imagery. So that's really the stuff that people are used to. So I can turn this on and you get a pixelated preview. So this is not the high res stuff, but number one, it shows me this is a cloud free image, which it also tells you over here. So this is actually something very useful. And I know it, it's, I see that it covers all three of the villages that I'm interested in, because this is the first one over here. Here's the second one and up in the north is the third one. They collected a second image more going to the other side that only covers one of the images. So what I did is to actually get this image. And as I said, you can either purchase that, but a lot of these big providers such as Maxa, Planet, Airbus, they have press offices and folks and communications folks that want to work with journalists. So you can reach out to them, you can establish relationships, and they are very often able and very willing to help you and maybe give you the image for free. Um, because, you know, like they that's their job, they want to be helpful. Um, I want to quickly show this. I hope this shows up. So this is now the very high resolution satellite image uh, from March 
2019, that shows the village being heavily damaged. You see the black earth, you see the, rem the remnants of the Tukuls. So this is something that I would then use for a story to publish. But of course, there's an analytic value if you get the GeoTIFF, let's say, and you, you load this into uh, an GS program such as QGS or ArcGIS, then you can start counting, which I did. And I started counting all the individual structures that were either damaged or destroyed and then break it down by, by town. Um, so that allowed me really to like really dig into that story, relying heavily on remotely sensed data. Um, and that's exactly sort of like what my job is. And again, I combine it with a lot of other things. And I'm also a regular journalist interviewing people. So don't forget about that, of course, in your work. But it's a pretty simple and straightforward uh, workflow in real life. This might take a couple of days, right? So if I do a 15 minute talk about this, doesn't mean it takes 15 minutes. Uh, it is hard to find these things sometimes. But you know what I'm also recommending is work with your teammates, ask them for their input, ask them to check your work, reach out to experts. Most importantly, try to reach out to local people who might know the geography, they might know about seasonal burnings, they might know about the architecture, do your own research about these kind of features. So all of that is useful to approach these type of stories. I wanna throw out, and I know I go very quick, but everything I'm gonna show is basically public. And for the examples I'm gonna show now, I put in the actual link to the stories, or you can just Google them to really like read the stories and look in more te detail. So these are just a few quick examples that um, I don't do on a daily basis, but that you know like come up once in a while um, and that in my opinion become also more and more important. So I'm gonna quickly throw out a few examples how we used uh, remote sensing in reporting and all of these examples are published examples um, and hopefully we'll also generate some, some questions um, which I try to answer, but luckily we have some other experts on the on the call here who will help out, I hope. In terms of artificial intelligence and using artificial intelligence and automated change detection or, or analysis of satellite imagery, I have very limited experience, but we recently did a fantastic story that really, really shows the actual added value that artificial intelligence can have if you have the right story and the right challenge. Uh, for example, it's 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 very easy. I think for years now that example comes up all the time. It's easy for the algorithm to find swimming pools in satellite imagery. That's great. I have never done a story that required looking for swimming pools in a, so it, it's a little bit of limited use, right? So you really want to think about where does the added value of these algorithms come in? And I don't want to diminish sort of the work that goes behind setting up these systems. Um, but it's it's not that easy. So artificial intelligence will not just take over my job, I think, and uh, sort of like replace all the work that we have to put into these kind of things, but it can help massively if you have the right story. So when the big, the big uh, story came up, when was it five, four or five months ago about the Chinese balloon that generated so much attention, you know, I always think about satellite imagery. So I spent probably a hot 30 minutes to think about and look for the balloon in satellite imagery, which was quite a hard and not successful undertaking. Uh, I tried not too hard, I have to say, but we suddenly had a video of the balloon, like filmed from the ground that shows the balloon hovering over the airport in Billings, Montana. So I suddenly had a specific location and a specific date and time. So I thought to myself, why don't I quickly check satellite imagery uh, for the balloon. And of course, what I was looking for was a white blob in a satellite image. And I gave up after 20 minutes um, and I moved on with my life. But luckily, my colleague Mui uh, was a little bit more ambitious and she did more research on this. Um, and she found a company called Synthetic, who especially is an, an artificial intelligence company, and they were doing the same thing, but using their their uh, image analysis platform and their algorithms to look for the balloon as well. And the guy who was running this is a little bit smarter than me. So he was actually looking, he, 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 do a, uh, he drew a little sketch of how a balloon might look like in a satellite image. And it's the first example, I drew the orange box around it um, because what he was looking for is more a combination of blue, red and green uh, blobs instead of the white blob that I was looking for. Um, 
and the reason for that is I'm not going to go into detail here, but we wrote up the methodology on this <clears throat> is that if you have like objects right that are between the ground and the satellite or that they're moving, most notably planes, but also a balloon, you know, the satellite goes over pretty fast. There's a, a very small difference between the capture of the different bands because it's not just one single image, a satellite image, right? But it's a composite of the various bands and you bring that together and it's nicely geo-referenced to the ground feature, so everything lines up nicely, but then you have that object in the sky, there might be a misalignment, right? Which I think is called parallax effect. And again, you can read more about that in the story. So here you see sort of the balloon captured in the red, green and blue bands. And this is how it looks like. So he knew what he was looking for. He fed that sketch into his system and using planet imagery and Sentinel-2 uh, imagery, he was suddenly able to find the balloon in a lot of places around the world, going back to January 15th when it was launched in China. So we were able to go back in time several weeks and identify the launch uh, area in China. Um, so this would not have been, we, I could have not done this if I had 10 reporters to do this, we would not have been able to do that because they were going through millions of square miles of satellite imagery. Um, and that really tells me this is the added value right, of, of artificial intelligence because it can do something that as an in individual scientist or journalist or analyst uh, could not do. Um, and it's two components here, of course. You need the algorithm, but you also need the, the satellite imagery coverage. So five, ten years ago, you could have not, not done this project because you would not have had planetscope imagery and sentinel imagery that cover every spot on Earth on an almost daily basis. So it's the two parts, right? The increased coverage and the increased temporal resolution combining this artificial intelligence. Um, Synthetic and Planet recently did a webinar just that, that features a lot of this story in a lot of detail and I put the link in the resource slide. So they are in a much better position to explain the details on this. So if you're interested in this, I really encourage you to watch that specific webinar. A um, couple of other examples, don't forget about Landsat. So Landsat has a very low spatial resolution of around 15 to 30 meters, I believe, depending on which one, you, which Landsat you use. But so, so that means you cannot show a lot of the features that I'm sometimes interested in showing, such as uh, airplanes and cars and things like that. But of course, Landsat has been around for decades and you can, I use this as my time machine, right? So I recently did a story on a remote underground Air Force Base in Iran. Um, and I wanted to check out when construction of that site started and I thought it would go maybe back a year or two. But it turned out I had to go back 10 years. And so there was not really planet scope and Sentinel imagery available. Maxa and Airbus, of course, have the high res stuff that goes back decades, but um, they don't image that area very often. So then I was stuck with maybe an image every two years. So I went to Lancer that I actually used in a very simple uh, visualization that we published, right? Basically a little time machine starting in July 2013, where there's nothing there and then the excavation start. And then in the last few years, suddenly the airstrip is showing up and Landsat imagery and the spatial resolution it has is perfectly fine for that kind of stuff. So don't forget about that. But Landsat, of course, is not just um, optical imagery, right? But you have very good spatial resolution, which I try to use a little bit sometimes. And again, this is not my expertise. In this case, I was doing a story on a wildfire in Oregon that actually spread really, really fast. So the story was focused on why is it spreading so fast and what really happened there. So it was a kind of reconstruction. And we used uh, the thermal bands of Landsat for this, which is what you see here. Um, the dark spots on the ground show you sort of like the, the temperature surface, right? So this is a very hot area where it's dark and this is where the wildfire was spreading on the ground. And this was taken around, I think, an hour after the wildfire started. And using video from the ground, I was no, I, I was able to exactly pinpoint the location where the fire started. <clears throat> and then, and again, then the, the journalistic thinking has to come in: is how do you tell that story? Um, maybe the normal way would do is you show the optical image first, or the, the true color image first, and then you switch to this. But I went the other way to create a little bit of a reveal and a little bit of sort of something interesting. So in the actual video, we started with the thermal image. Here's where it started. This is how it spread over maybe one hour. And then we switched 
to the natural color image and it nicely shows sort of like the smoke plume which actually looks like it's very very low because it was so windy um, and then we laid over some data about human geography right that here are the towns here's the streets and it went exactly in this direction so it was kind of a nice little detail and visual detail to throw into that story as well um, radar imagery something in I find very hard to number one interpret and almost impossible to process if you <laughs> haven't studied it. Um, so I use it in a limited way, but I find it extremely useful, um, especially the example that I have here, which is around flooding in Germany, I think a couple of years ago. Um, if you use satellite imagery to show natural disasters such as hurricanes and flooding, you have the problem that it's extremely cloudy. So you normally have to wait a few days until you get clear uh, optical imagery, SAR imagery or radar, radar imagery, which uses an active sensor, uh, can look through clouds amongst other qualities. And it can look, can image at night, these kind of things. So you don't have to wait that. It, it's, it's very useful for, for these kind of natural disasters, but it also highlights sort of like flooding and moisture. Um, so here you see sort of like the dark areas here of flooded areas and initially there was a quarry wall between these two flooded areas which eventually collapsed and led to a big disaster. In this case I used very high resolution radar imagery provided by ISI. The advantage of companies like ISI and Capella from a journalistic perspective is also that the resolution is so good that it almost looks like an optical image so it's much easier for human interpretation and it's easier for the reader I think to understand actually what's going on. I'm also using Sentinel-1 imagery, which is, uh, again, radar imagery. It's a little bit harder to use it in the public con context without presenting or without explaining it through various paragraphs, but I'm still using it. And that's also a, a sort of like a good takeaway is that a lot of the, the imagery that I use, I use for reporting purposes that I might describe in an article, but I might not necessarily use the image itself. Uh, the one example I have here is that in the run-up to the to Russia's invasion of Ukraine last year, I did a lot of blog posts documenting the Russian military buildup around Ukraine. In one case, Maxa provided uh, great imagery of a military buildup at an airfield in Belarus. I think the image was dated February 10th, 2022. So, I and again, this is like you want to be a little bit thinking about like what else can I do with this. I don't want to just publish this image and say this is a new deployment of Russian troops because Max, Max's last cloud, Max's, Max's class, last cloud-free image of that specific airfield was from exactly a year before. If I go to Google Earth, the last sort of high-res image that I had was maybe from the summer before, and there were no troops there. So the question that came up that came up for me is well, are these troops actually newly deployed in the last week or two, or have they been put there several months ago? Because the image itself doesn't tell me that, the high-res image. Uh, the problem was that it was a very cloudy time. So all the imagery, the high-res imagery that was collected in the previous weeks was cloudy. So that's where I used Sentinel-1 imagery. Looking at this airfield, which was basically an inactive airfield, suddenly 10 days before this Maxa image, the activity really popped up. So the brightness levels in that area really changed because suddenly Russia moved in vehicles and airplanes and tents. And so all I could tell is like suddenly activity started, started around 10 days before and using the high resolution image from Maxa, um, I was actually able to tell you what that activity was. Um, so I just put this in there, right? Like we actually used analysis of radar imagery to confirm that this happened very, very recently versus just putting out the image and without any context and saying like this is new, right? Because one satellite image doesn't tell you the timeline, of course. Um, and the last thing before I uh, open up to Q&A is scripts, which also is not my area of expertise, but uh, luckily there are people such as Pierre, who is on this call, who <laughs> provide uh, these scripts. Um, in this case, I used a um, a, a wildfire script for Sentinel imagery. And this is a Sentinel-2 image that I used in a story. And the orange dots that you see here are heat signatures that are detected in a suburb of Kiev. So again, I used sort of the, the wildfire methodology and reapplied it to conflict monitoring. 
Um, and this was in March of last year, so right at the beginning of the, the Rus of Russia's invasion, especially around Kyiv. And the one thing I want to highlight is that these are not flames, right? And that's also something that I put in the caption of the image. That it, this is a visualization of infrared emission hotspots, because if you look at this, especially because of the colors, people might think these are actually active flames, which it's not. And again, this is my switch to the resources, because that kind of language I pulled from Pierre's blog, who is describing this very clearly, that you want to point out if you use this kind of visualizations, make sure to the reader that you're explaining what you're actually looking at versus just putting out a very dramatic image. So I can highly recommend both the scripts that are available on this website here, but also sort of like the caveats and how do you adjust sort of like your own visualizations. And I'm going to end here. So this is the last slide that I'm not going to go through in detail. It's a long, actually a short list of a few practical uh, posts on the internet, right, that I find good to get started with, but also a couple of readings um, that you can, it's like more academic readings that you can dig into. All right, I'm going to end here and I'm trying to answer your questions, but as I said, I think there are more people on the call who can help with, present, uh, with answering questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, this was a great treat today. It was a nice insight into your amazing work and thanks for sharing all this with us. Uh, like you said, we can proceed with questions and first review those already asked in the chat. And uh, in the meantime, you can still write uh, your questions if you have in the chat or later when we answer those, you can uh, speak and I will just raise your hand and I will unmute you. So the first question, I believe, came from Steve. He wants to use more satellite imagery in Canada for the environment, and he wants to know how can he network to meet more professionals. Are you aware of something like that? Um, the one thing that pops up immediately in my head, but I don't know the exact name of it. There is a, a Slack channel or a Slack um, deployment that's just focused on geospatial work and experts and it's open to everyone and it seems to be very active and a lot of people are in there so i think that could be a sort of a good way to just if you join that channel and maybe we can connect over twitter right i'm very active on twitter you can send me a direct message there or my on my new york times website you can contact it me through that as well because i can look that up that that specific name um that might be a good way for, for networking purposes. Um, and it seems to be a very global community, so that's pretty good. I mean, otherwise, what I normally do when I try to like focus in on specific topics <clears throat> or areas is like just create Twitter lists and of people who work specifically on environmental issues, in your case, maybe specifically in Canada. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, sure about your background, but obviously universities are just a fantastic resource. So I, I look up geography departments but you might be a professor, I don't know, right? So <laughs> it's that kind of thing that I normally do to find sort of like uh, like-minded people in addition to going to conferences and do networking. Then we have a similar question regard, uh, regarding meeting uh, more professionals. Um, so one of our listeners want to use satellite imagery in Portugal for help in the wildfires. And he, he would like to meet more professionals to work with. Do you maybe also have some resources in this direction? Um, I think it's the same answer. So definitely, I don't know anyone in Portugal. So I'm sorry, um, but it's it's the same thing. So the European since Portugal, right? The European Union is doing a lot, has various programs around sort of like wildfire monitoring. Um, and sort of like using sort of these kind of tools for like remote sensing tools for for monitoring natural disasters. I'm actually just there's like currently a, a webinar series happening that's every Tuesday at eight in the morning my time, where they go through every week a different topic. Like this week was wildfires. Next week I think it's more around air air quality or, or water issues and things like that. Um, and so. So like there are some really good resources. I think, what is it, Oymetsat? Like I can look that up quickly and put in the chat. Um, but they also have a website of, of case studies, for example, that they mentioned in, uh, 
in that specific for that specific uh, webinar. So I'm going to put this. I can try to put this in the chat here as well. Quickly, so they are organizing. I think that that series, um, and they have case studies here. So that might be a good way to sort of like get started and reach out to some of these experts and presenters. Otherwise, one of our listeners, Bonnie, was also mentioning uh, that there are strong communities on Twitter, and yeah, uh, this is also a good resource to start searching. Then we had another question. Um, if you can elaborate more, how do you import OpenStreetMap or Wikimapia data to Google Earth? Do these two data sets cover the entire Earth? I maybe I can find this quickly, but for Wikimapia and GeoNames, yes. So I, you can just pull down that data as a KML if you Google it and search for it. To make it easier, I posted a link on Twitter that I can share. That includes uh, Wikimapia and GeoNames and a specific data set on Syria. Um, so you can just download that and then you have it in Google Earth forever pretty much or save that, that file maybe somewhere. Um, I think it's network links to the update automatically. So this is sort of like for geographic data, right? GeoNames, Wikimapia, that kind of stuff you can just pull in and I put that, the link in here. What I normally do is if I look at specific countries such as Syria or Myanmar, <clears throat> and Myanmar is a great example, I go to a website called Humanitarian Data Exchange. And that is sort of a sharing platform for humanitarian organizations to share all forms of data, including a lot of geospatial data. So if you look, if you look like, let's say you go to Portugal or Canada or Myanmar, and you go to the country website on that data website, and you search for admin, you normally get admin folders. So when I was working on the, the crimes against humanity campaign against the Rohingya in Rakhine state a few years ago, around 2016, thank you, somebody just posted it. Um, I was confronted, I had all these videos that I tried to verify and geolocate and photos of, of Rohingya villages being burnt down in Rakhine. And so what you get is a video and he's like, here is a fire in this and this village this morning. So you go to Google, there's no way you find that village. So I went to this website data.humdata.org and I found a fantastic P code data set with all settlement names in English and native language just for download, right? As a spreadsheet. And this was put together with what I think was called MIMO, like a, the Myanmar Information Unit, but they were working and funded, I think, by the UN. So they put together this incredible geospatial data set on settlement names in, in Myanmar. I downloaded that as a spreadsheet and narrowed it down to Rakhine State. <clears throat> and then I did two things. I was able to search this in the spreadsheet for the village names, and very often I found it. But also since it had a latitude and longitude column, I used this just as a C CSV file, and you can drag and drop that into Google Earth. And then you have again um, sort of like that data set in Google Earth directly. Because if you just know the general area and maybe the spelling is off, you can still look around and you might find a village that has a very similar sounding name. Um, and then you might still be able to match up features and confirm the, the video, right? So always look for country specific stuff. But then you can use the global data sets such as uh, GeoNames and Wikimap here. OpenStreetMap, which I almost forgot, there is a site called Turbo Overpass Turbo, where you can export specific features from OpenStreetMap. So, for example, I want to export rail lines and streets from southern Ukraine into Google Earth. I would go there and try to export it. One challenge is that. It's it's not a very intuitive website and you have to type in the features you're looking for and very often I get an error message. So sometimes I struggle a little bit. It takes me, you know, half an hour or so until I figure it out, but it still works pretty well. And I have seen people recently commenting a lot that actually chat GTP is super helpful in coming up with the exact query that you want to put in there. So you ask chat GTP, hey, I want to export all streets from Ukraine what is the code I have to put into this website and then it gives it back to you. I tried it once and it didn't work, but that might be more a testimony to my skills than ChatGTP. Um, 
So that's absolutely a side as well. What you have on humanitarian data exchange, you have a lot of the open street map experts already in there. So humanitarian or other groups already put the OSM experts in there as few data sets. And we have one question from Arki. Uh, he was asking if it's possible to get the planet scope or similar resolution imagery for non-commercial use and uh, Sentinel Hub, your browser only gives low resolution images after a certain zoom level. So I can ex ex answer this one. We uh, provide access to Network of Resources program, which is uh, funded and sponsored by European Space Agency. Within this program, you can get uh, free access to Sentinel Hub subscriptions and uh, high resolution data. And I would suggest that you check that out. And the, maybe also to emphasize that the links, the relevant links from this webinar will be uh, stated in the description of the video. So we will state also the link to network of resources. Moving to the next question uh, from Matthew, he was asking, which do you find more useful when pulling in other sources uh, like firms, Wiki, Mapia, etc., to QGIS or Google Earth? My very big answer, I apologize, is I find both useful. On a daily basis, I mostly use Google Earth. And the reason for that is because number one of the nature of the work I'm doing is so much I'm putting on there is just like single data points. So like, oh, there's a video filmed here and I put on the data point here and I put in like, you know, this very fancy camera symbol that Google Earth provides. And then I put in a link to the to to Twitter or Telegram where that video is from. Um, so I, I create sort of my own manual data sets and Google Earth is really great for that. But also I, I need the very high resolution satellite imagery that again, Google Earth obviously it's right there. You can pull it into QGIS, of course. Um, to use that and then I start organizing all my reporting actually in Google Earth. Like I create folders and subfolders and subfolders. I pull in big data sets, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it has a second sort of like added value, which is once we're ready for production, which means producing graphics or producing videos, I download part of that KML file and I hand it over to our graphics person or our motion graphics designer, which I can't do. So it becomes very easy to share amongst the teams, including people who may be not familiar with GIS software that much. So it becomes just very a very easy tool in that sense. But of course, I use QGIS as well. I used ArcGIS before because I was trained in ArcGIS. Now I'm having a Mac with a Mac chip that when I got it did not allow me to install a virtual machine. Uh, so I couldn't run Windows and I couldn't run ArcGIS and I use more and more QGIS, which I find a great tool anyway. So I use that. I used it yesterday, for example, QGIS, because then I have what I'm doing there is I'm pulling in planet scope imagery through the planet plugin. With an image from yesterday. And I'm starting to draw trenches in Russia and Ukraine, right? And it just it's just easier to do that in QGIS and then pulling in data sets where the rivers are and natural defense lines and that kind of stuff. You know, so then QGIS is just much more useful, I think, or I did like also then more like analysis on wildfires in the Amazon where I pulled in active fire data and then I want to crop it to a certain state or district. All of that, like all these like GIS, simple GS operations I would do in QGIS and not and you, to some degree, you can't do them in, in Google Earth, as far as I know. So, so I use both for sure. But what you, what tool do you really need? You know, that's a, a case by case basis. Then they was asking. Um, actually, there was a quite lively discussion uh, regarding one of your high resolution images in the chat uh, from Mali, uh, which you used in the presentation in the end. And there was a question: Is that simply regular optic image or false color, or something else? That was an optical image, um, which and this should for the work that I do at least, I mostly use uh, true color imagery, right? I think that's the question. Um, I use true color image because if you the New York Times and you have a regularly large audience, if I put out a false color image, I would have to write two paragraphs to explain why the trees are red. I cannot put out an, an image in the New York Times where the trees are red without explaining it. 
that should not be an obstacle if if there is a need to for the false color image because it shows something that absolutely I would put out the false color image just to show the damage in this case I would put I would prefer to put out the true color image but use the false color image for reporting. Now I'm representing a very 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 tiny part of the New York Times. Um, for example my colleagues in the graphics team and they have been doing this for much longer than I've been doing this they're doing fantastic work using satellite imagery in a very different way, right? They use large data sets. They're looking at much bigger geographies, which might be a whole state or a whole country. And they use tools like Google Earth Engine. And, and they're looking at more scientific applications, right? So for that kind of stuff, absolutely, you would use false color and other things. But for a simple example like this, I would, I would uh, vote for the true color image for sure. And there was uh, one question regarding the crediting uh, and uh, one of the participants uh, is wondering uh, if he she can use uh, satellite images posted by individuals or satellite service companies in public platforms like Twitter and LinkedIn. What are your experiences about that? Related to that, I, I'm just seeing that Steve Wood from the Maxon News Bureau is in the chat and he I think is sharing to his contact info. So make sure to look at that because Steve is is one of my regular partners in crime I would say um, and he's always super helpful and related to this question right like Maxa for example releases publicly usable imagery but the crediting guidelines are very clear right and I use the same principle no matter who the provider is um, I would not publish an image without giving proper credit absolutely I mean that's that's not okay and we can't do that um, and I will get in trouble internally and externally, I'm sure. So I'm always making sure and also it, it, it goes back to transparency, right? What I'm trying to go here for is a somewhat scientific process that somebody else can look up that same satellite image and repeat my analysis, right? And satellite imagery is perfect for that because it comes with intact metadata. So you have an exact timestamp. Obviously, you have the coordinates. If it's a video from Telegram, it gets harder, right? You have to establish this manually. Uh, putting out the date and the location and the image provider, that is transparency. That is just super important in satellite imagery. So I try to be very clear on that. William was asking, uh, what was actually your journey to using remote sensing and what was your first story you worked on with satellite imagery? Oh man, that is a great question, wow. Um, now I have to go back decades, I'm that old, but no, not really. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, my in my background, I started out studying history and political science in Austria, and I was interested in contemporary history in Austria, and which landed me in the field of more like Holocaust studies. But I, I was working at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. 20 years ago for a year. Um, and that was in 2003, 2004, which was exactly when the four, the genocide in the four happened. So I learned a lot about that topic and I got very interested in contemporary conflict and human rights issues. And the four was one of the first conflicts and, and big human rights issues that was documented basically in almost real time um, with satellite imagery. So in 2004, Amnesty Denmark, I believe already, Amnesty International, used already I think Landsat imagery so lower resolution imagery to document the burnings in the four and then in 2007 which when I was an intern at at Amnesty International they launched a website called eyes on the four um, where they used high resolution imagery uh, which I think was from back then digital globe which is now Maxer um, to to sort of like document the ongoing destruction, but also to to monitor villages that were not attacked yet, because it's more it's a, it's a, Amnesty is a campaigning organization, so it was a little a sort of global neighborhood watch that they put out there that was fascinating. I started like one year before I did that that internship while I was still studying. Number one, I went back to the Holocaust Museum to to volunteer there at their genocide prevention program, and they looked at the four with satellite imagery. While I was in class, I was looking at Myanmar and the American Association for the Advancement of Science <clears throat> back then was using high resolution satellite imagery to monitor the conflict in Myanmar. And what these two places have in common, of course, is 
they are somewhat accessible in this conflict zone. So the four was completely off limits to both humanitarian workers and journalists or human rights observers. Um, that's where the added value of satellite imagery comes in. Myanmar, very remote villages in forested areas, again, very hard to access. The first use of high resolution satellite imagery that I'm aware of that by an NGO was done around 2002, where the US Committee for Human Rights in North Korea used MAXA imagery to document the massive prison camps in North Korea. Again, no access to North Korea. So all of these things sort of like told me it's like, oh, there's actually a very clear added value for satellite imagery for human rights monitoring, which is my, my initial background. So this is sort of like how I got into this space, being very interested in more contemporary issues and then looking at sort of like hard to access locations. Um, by now, of course, so this was all 15, 20 years ago, but now there are so many more uses and applications, but we still use it for, for conflict zones and things like that to, to monitor in real time. Thank you for sharing that. I think we are exceeding our time for today, Christoph, but do you have time for answering two more questions or? Uh... Yes, absolutely. Okay, because it's getting really uh, interesting. <laughs> So uh, we got another question from Alexander. He uh, was wondering if, if you can um, elaborate uh, on using satellite imagery in a case of Bucha investigation. So New York Times was the first media to detect dead bodies laying on the streets of Bucha in U Ukraine. And uh, did your team specifically request that images from Maxar or what is your usual uh, workflow in such cases? Mm -hmm. So, um... My colleagues did that story, but obviously I was I sort of like I was here for that. It, it's sort of like I think it shows the added value if you make satellite imagery and remote sensing part of your standard routine workflow. So as soon as this was beginning of April of last year, the Russians withdraw from Butcher, independent observers go in and what they find is dead bodies along a street. They start filming and sharing that on social media. So my colleagues, you know, started looking at satellite imagery um, from various providers to see, to again, try to establish a timeline because of course the Russian claims are like, we didn't do that, They're like we withdraw and now the Ukrainians are staging this. So using satellite imagery, which is basically a time machine, right? You can go back days and weeks to see if the bodies were already there and bodies finding in a satellite imagery can be a little bit hard. Using the videos, my colleagues, you know, geolocated where exactly these videos were filmed, so they knew where to look. Then you look at various providers, and then they reach out to somebody like Steve from Maxer to sort of like check in, like, hey, you know, like, hey, we, we know you have an image from this and this date. We believe the bodies are there. Can you provide high quality imagery? Um, and I remember Steve and his team, they were looking at this very carefully, again, because it's such small objects, right? So. Maybe they, they have the raw imagery, obviously, they can do a little bit of enhancements in the sense of confirming some of the facts, um, which is like sort of like standard methodology in GS software, right? Um, to sort of like look at, can you really establish a timeline when this board is there, showed up the first time? So it's a combination of reporting on our team, having the relationships with uh, image providers, um, having collaborators, in the in this image uh, in this uh, satellite imaging companies right that we work on a regular basis with and again like companies like Max and Planet have dedicated teams to do that and work with journalists and that's just super helpful so it's a little bit of a back and forth and sometimes with the image providers in addition to doing our, of course our own reporting and and looking at the imagery and and, and confirming the location and then finding sort of like uh, leads in the satellite imagery themselves that you then try to get the higher quality stuff to really confirm it. And uh, let's uh, take one more last question. Uh, it's coming from Giles, who is sharing your uh, troubles uh, with this kind of work. So he's, he explained that uh, they have worked with uh, interferometric SAR in Ukraine for destruction assessment and in Bakhmut, Mariupol and other cities. And uh, he understands your pain working with this kind of data. And some of their uh, maps have been uh, published by the New York Times. He also shared the link uh, in the chat. And he's asking, do you think that the general public is ready for data visualizations outside of the classic RGB 3D pictures in the near future? What do you say? 
Yeah, yes, that's my short answer. I mean, the law. So number one, let me see like that kind of, <clears throat> this is a perfect example where I would not do this myself, but I'm relying on experts. I could never do <clears throat> this kind of radar imagery analysis to let's say um, assess the impact of an earthquake or similar. So this is a perfect example. Um, yes, absolutely. I think you can use these visualizations. It, you just have to take your time with it, right? And because we have sometimes such complex stories that we then present in video form, it takes just, maybe the, the, the reporting takes three months, but then it takes another two months to put the video together. And we obviously have to simplify, right? And you, it's a, it's a lot of back and forth between reporters and then editors, right? Who the editors, of course, are right that is like, oh, what you wrote here, nobody will understand that. So they rewrite it and then it's maybe not 100% accurate anymore. So then I rewrite it again, right? It's like, so it's a little bit of a, if you have strong editors who help you sort of getting to the point to make it understandable for a large audience, that's what you need, right? And that of course is an advantage at the New York Times. I think absolutely we should not shy away from using very advanced and complicated methodologies, collaborating with scientists to do reporting and then it's our job to make it understandable and visualize it in an understandable way. So I'm, I'm all for that. Thank you, Christoph, for all your explanations, answering all the questions. I think you did a wonderful job uh, at today's presentation. Uh, there were uh, many of links shared also by our participants in the chat. So like, men like I mentioned before, we will try to include them in the description of uh, our recording. There was also one good resource pointed out as uh, Bellingcat, and it's perfect opportunity for me to announce the next webinar, which will happen in the second half of June. We will host uh, Elliot from Bellingcat, so stay tuned for uh, this as well. And at this point, I would like to thank you all for being with us today and a really big thanks to Christoph uh, and also to Pierre and Andras for backing up. But Christoph did a really good job for, with answering everything. Feel free to ask more questions on our Sentinel Hub forum. Thank you and uh, see you the next time. Thank you.